I know a lot of you guys are big news and things, so some of you guys will know. We'll know this story, but in August of this year, a pretty remarkable thing happened in the world of music. A song came out from a completely unknown, independent, you know, unsigned artist who never had a hit song before, and it debuted at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. That means it was the most popular, the number one most popular most listened to song in all of America. That means it beat out Taylor Swift, Jason Aldean, or whoever else would have been on the chart set. Toby Mac. And it never happened before. That was the first in history. The artist, 31-year-old folk singer-songwriter from Virginia, named Oliver Anthony. And without any promotion from a big-time record label, without even any help in production from a big-time record label, this single, is a little song that by the name of the rich men north of Richmond, became a cultural phenomenon. In its first week after its release, it was listened to almost 20 million times. And by now, a couple months downstream from that, that number has grown to almost 80 million. And that is just streaming it on YouTube. That doesn't count people who bought it off Apple Music, listen to it on Spotify, heard it on the radio. Now, I want to be careful here, so listen up. This is not an official endorsement of that song. This is not me telling you it's a good song, you should go home and listen to it. So hear me tell you that before you decide to come yell at you later for mention. Listen to it or don't. I and mean, honestly, if you're going to listen to it, the vanity warning a little bit, okay? I'm not here to tell you if it's a good song. I'm just here to tell you some facts about it. It is, again, kind of a cultural phenomenon. So what makes a song like that so appealing? How does it beat the odds, defy history, and become the number one most listened to song in our country? Well, the appeal was undoubtedly the message of its lyrics. And that message is summed up pretty well in the lyric that he wrote there in the opening stanza. It's a shame what the world's gotten to for people like me and people like you. I wish I could just wake up and have it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is. Living in a new world. And from there, the rest of the song follows that pattern and paints a pretty bleak picture, although many would say an honest one, of life in this country. One where there's a cabal of rich men who run things, government and corporations who conspire together to exploit the vulnerable. The picture Anthony paints in this song is, is an image of an America where the people in charge are totally indifferent to the suffering of the poor, the suffering of the workers, really the suffering of anyone who isn't part of their little team of elite people, and it's often suffering that they create. Now, I mentioned that song this morning, again, not to tell you if he's right or wrong or it's good or bad, because really whether or not you agree with what it says about American life doesn't, doesn't matter right now, because it actually gives you a pretty decent picture and a pretty good feel for what life was like, not here, but for what life was like in the Israel where Micah lived and where Micah preached. That was a nation where the wealthy definitely conspired together in the marketplace, in the courtrooms, before the throne, even in the temple, to enrich themselves, and they cared nothing about the cries and the suffering of the needy and the vulnerable who were supposed to be their brothers and sisters. That was a nation where corruption had infected the temple, the courtroom, all the way to the camp. That is the incurable wound that is Israel's idolatry. You remember that phrase from Micah chapter 1, verse 8, which you said in last week. The incurable wound is so tragic, not just because it spoils the religious worship in the temple, but because it ruins the whole Israelite society, the whole society of God's people that's supposed to be ordered after God's word. But the less they believed in the Torah, the law, the less they believed in the God who wrote it. And the 
unless they knew his heart, which is revealed in them. The less they knew God, the more corrupt, unholy, and wicked they became. The more like the sinful nations around them they became. And if you look there at Micah chapter 1 and verse 8, you'll see the prophet say that it is because of that incurable wound that he will lament this have sadness like mourning in a funeral. He will lament, he will grieve, he will mourn. He actually says he will mourn like the ostriches. And I'm just going to tell you, best of luck in trying to figure out what that means. Because how does an ostrich mourn? Remember, though, as you read that, that when Michael, when Michael laments, when he says, I will wail and, and I will mourn for Israel, he is a man who speaks for God. That's what a prophet does. So his grief that he's talking about for the nation, for his brothers and sisters, it's not just his grief. It's not his alone. This is God's grief expressed through Micah's words. This is God's heartbreak because he looks at the mess that his people have become. He looks at the unholiness where there should be holiness. He looks at children who are supposed to follow after his every word but, but actually don't know him at all. When he looks at Israel, it's like he's looking at a bride who commits adultery against him every single day. As made the theme of Hosea. God laments because when Micah steps out on the street corners in Jerusalem and he preaches the warning message that's here for us in chapter 2, verse 1, that is where our study begins today. When Micah says, Woe to you who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. And then when the morning dawns, they perform it because they can, because it's in the power of their hand. God laments because when Micah preaches that, that warning is not just for some small group within Israel. He's speaking to a vast cadre of leaders, to an entire class of society, to the judges, the magistrates, the elders at the city gates, priests in the temple, the other professional prophets who wander about Jerusalem. That message, that warning is for all of them, all the way up to the king who sits on the throne. Isaiah was actually on the other side of Jerusalem at the same time. Micah and Isaiah, their ministries overlap. They're preaching at the same time. Isaiah put it pretty accurately and pretty succinctly. When he talked about the rulers of Israel, he simply called them rulers of Sodom, which is supposed to express how depraved and corrupt everything is. The sinfulness of Israel's entire leadership class is the main focus of Micah chapter 2 and chapter 3. It is God bearing witness against them and exposing their sins. And what we see we read these chapters is, is that Israel had turned into a tragic satire of what it should have been. It's like a dystopia on the order of you know Orwell's 1984 or, or Huxley's Brave New World. It's, it's a nation where everything is upside down. Everything's the opposite of what it's supposed to be. And powers that be are so entrenched and so protective of the corrupt thing that they've built that there's no one in the land who's going to do anything. And here, it's like every detail of the story makes it even more tragic and even more perverse. Because, you know, why? Why do this? Why, why, when you were given the perfect law, why break the heart of God and build a society that's so evil and so broken and so unjust when, when you were given the pattern of how it's be. Why do all this evil? Why grieve the heart of God instead of blessing? Why take from the needy? 
Why steal justice from the poor? Here's what's so gross and sad about it. The answer is simple. It boils down to one word. And it's just greed. It's just that unending desire for more. Israel is this way because the people who run the country are the kind of people who would read who would read like David's words in Psalm 73 where he writes that he is envious of the prosperity of the wicked. And then they wouldn't read that next part that says, but their fat and sleep bodies are going to die anyway. Um, they just read that part about the prosperity of the wicked and they say, well, that's who I want. Those are the guys who must have it all figured out because they're the ones who have so much money they make David jail. The leaders of Israel are this way. They, they do all this evil just because their hearts, they're not filled with the desire for God's glory. They're filled with the desire for greed or more. To stack up more stuff, more money, more power for themselves. We see that in verse 2 in Micah chapter 2. Israel's this way because they covet fields and seize them. It breaks the 10th commandment. I'm not covet them. Covet fields and seize them. They covet houses and they take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. They take from a man what was owed to him through the lineage of his father. The height of injustice. God has more to say about this actually down in verse 8. Listen to what he says there. God says that they're so evil and so corrupt that they've risen up against him as an enemy. So far from God, it's not just like they stumble about and offend Him on accident. They are in active rebellion against Him. And I know that sounds really damning. To you. So let's just praise God for His grace because we remember this morning the enemies of God. That is, that is who all of us at one time were. That is the natural state born into death and dead in trespasses. Enemies of God with, with no hope of becoming allies of His on our own. And how beautifully does Paul write, write this true confession that it is while we were still enemies of God that He died to believe and reconcile us. Christ shows His love for us in this that while we were still enemies of God and while we were still weak, He died these guys, God's right to call them his enemies because they commit violence against the people who God has compassion for. That's what you see there in verse 8, chapter 2. They commit violence against the sojourner, the stranger, the traveler. God said when people pass through Israel without a thought of war, that is, they have no intention of, of doing anything bad to you, doing any harm to anybody, they pass through Israel peacefully, but you rob them. You strip the road from their back. They go after the vulnerable, summarized in the law often as just widows or women and children. It says in verse 9, you drive the women out of their houses. You rob the children of my splendor. And that tells us that that their greed, their evil was so bad that it, it was actually like breaking down and destroying family life within the nation. The dads are already out of the house. They're going out to the fields, out to the marketplace to keep the roof over everyone's head and keep food on the table. That's how the family order was set. But now, they've so twisted this society that women can't stay in the home either. Women can't manage and nurture the family as wives and mothers. And they have to go out and earn food. Or their house is just going to be completely taken away. And then the children, they don't get to enjoy the stable, secure life that the law says they should have. That's what it means when God says his splendor is taken from them. Like I said, every, every detail of the story makes it even happen. Even more corrupt. Even more, ugh, just disgusting. 
because as you turn to Micah 3, you see that all this all this injustice, injustice is not, not orchestrated by men who, who were free to just kind of be neutral leaders and ah, whatever happens, happens, and they sort of created all this chaos by accident. All this injustice is made by guys who God says were actually supposed to be committed to justice. They weren't supposed to be neutral. They were supposed to be committed to the law, committed to, to bringing the heart of God to bear on the conduct of the nation. As we turn to Micah chapter 3, that's what it says right in the first verse. Micah calls out to the leaders again. He says, Hear, you heads of Jacob, and the rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? That's a call out. That's a challenge. That's Micah reminding the leaders of the nation, you guys were supposed to be the ones who stand up for the poor, who lend a hand to the vulnerable, who give to the needy. Not to give them special favor, not to elevate them in an unfair way, but to make sure that they would be heard, that they wouldn't just be forgotten, that their powerlessness wouldn't be exploited to turn them into slaves that money couldn't draw them a fair chance of justice. Isaiah reminds them in his preaching the job of Israel's leaders was to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, that is people who have no one to fight for them, and plead the cause of the widow. If no one else would so these guys who were supposed to be doing all this good and just stuff, it was their whole reason that they had authority. Just did the opposite. <coughs> Perverted the office. The men who were supposed to stand for justice in the land worked against them. So Micah told them in verse 2, you were supposed to be the guys who know justice. And that's like that intimate... You know, husband to wife knowledge, that's how much they were supposed to have a grip on the idea of justice. Instead, you hate good and you love evil. And from there, Micah uses some, some metaphorical language to, to illustrate just how cruel and, and oppressive these guys were. You know, you've heard that expression of taking food out of someone's mouth. Mm. Or taking the shirt off of someone's back. Listen to what God says these guys have done in verse 2 of chapter 3 there. These leaders are guys who tear the skin from off my people and flesh from off their bones. Forget the shirt. Who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them. So they feed themselves with what belongs to them. Break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pond. Like flesh in a pond. That's pretty graphic. It's pretty vivid. Micah speaks so graphically there because it really perfectly reveals just how ugly and vulgar the hatred is. It's not passive, it's like active hatred from the leaders to the people under their authority, to the poor and the vulnerable who really are supposed to be under their care. That kind of language announces to the nation that these leaders in Israel don't look, don't look at their poor brothers and sisters, their powerless brothers and sisters, as God's people, as His children, their siblings under the covenant who are supposed to be served, uplifted, taken care of, looked out for. And when they look at the board, they just see them like pieces of meat that can be bought and sold in the marketplace. That can be chopped up and thrown in the pot and made for them. When they look at the board, they just see bones that are there to be picked clean so there's nothing left. Objects to be abused. Used up. Exploited. Until everything's been picked clean. Those are not the attitudes and actions of men 
who care anything about justice, or goodness, or love, or mercy. That's why God says in verse 9, they detest justice. They don't just ignore it, they hate it. So they pervert everything that, that is good. They make crooked all that is straight. Most of the people in Israel, in this gilded age that they were in, life for them went like this. You go to the marketplace to buy stuff to feed your family. The people in the marketplace have scales that are dishonest, so they cheat you out of what you actually should get. So you're getting robbed in the marketplace. Then you go to the elders at the city gates because the elders are there to give wisdom and, and make rulings about little conflicts in the land and bring the Torah to bear on situations in people's lives, settle disputes. But you go to the elders at the city gate, somebody paid them off already. So you're not going to get any wisdom or justice there. And then you think, okay, this is a matter then for the magistrates and the judges in the court. But then you go to the court, somebody paid them off too. Not going to get any justice there. Maybe you can take it to the king. How are you even going to get him to listen to you when there's all these moneyed interests telling him, don't walk? So, where else are you going to go? Maybe you can go to the priests in the temple. The people who are responsible to shepherd the nation, to give people knowledge of God's word. Right? Maybe, maybe you can appeal to them and, and they'll bring the law to bear on all this injustice that you suffer. Oh. Sorry. They're in on the corruptions. Chapter 3, verse 11. The priests teach for Christ. That means they aren't teaching the truth. In fact, Mike also reveals to us not only are they not teaching the truth, they're actively trying to stop other people from teaching the truth. Silence. So when they hear Micah saying things like this, preaching all these things, warning the nation that they're in rebellion, you know, doing the things that prophets of God are sent to do, they don't support them. In fact, they try to shut them down. Maybe they call it disinformation. They try to keep the people of God from hearing the truth. Verse 6. They say, do not preach. One should not preach things like this. That means that they are, they are silencing the truth and trying to convince the people, don't listen to him. He shouldn't even be saying this stuff because, because well, God is perfectly happy with, with how things are. God is perfectly happy with how the nation runs. You got robbed in the marketplace. God's good. Let the good times be. Verse 11, there in chapter 3. The only message, the only message that they will allow people to hear. Or sorry, this is chapter 2. The only message that will allow people to hear that people will receive is not one that, that preaches difficult truth that might be hard to hear, but that is nonetheless true and has to be dealt with, the only message that people are allowed to hear is one that just calls for more wine and strong drink. One that says, God totally approves. He's just going to give us more and more and more of all this good stuff we want. So don't worry about the law. Party on. Well, okay, so if the priests won't teach the truth, and the priests won't stand up for justice, and they won't preach the word. Where else can you go? Well, there's these guys who walk around Israel calling themselves prophets, right? So, the prophets, they'll stand up for the poor. That's what prophets are supposed to do. Nope. Not these ones. Anyway. Because all these guys running around Israel calling themselves prophets, basically the key exception of Israel and Mike or Isaiah and Micah, excuse me. The prophets are on the tape too. They're part of the machine. In chapter 3, verse 5, is where God simply says, these are prophets who lead my people astray. 
and if you talk some more about them there in that section, what you see is like if you could afford to fill their bellies, you could afford to give them nice things. Well, the prophets will tell you it's all good news for you. Shalom. Peace. God approves. Don't have to worry. He's so happy about you, he's just going to keep blessing you more and more. If you can feed a prophet, if you can pay him off, he'll tell you that. But if you can't afford to offer him anything, and the poor, right, wouldn't be able to afford, they can't put food on their own table, much less put it in the mouths of one of these prophets. You can't give them anything good. The message is the opposite. But God's not happy with you. In fact, God declares war against people like you. Isn't the good news reached to the poor, reached to the prison? Isn't the message of peace one that belongs to them? Not according to these people. That's a message reserved for people who could afford the food. There's a little word in chapter 3, this little section that goes from verse 9 through 11 that just gives us a summary statement for just how woefully sinful and sorry this whole situation was. Hear this, you heads of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood, and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give a judgment for a bribe, which breaks so many laws in Exodus and Deuteronomy and I could be here all morning giving you verses and chapters. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. And so that wasn't bad enough. The most perverse thing about these guys has Stephen been said. It's there in verse 12. And it's maybe the most revealing word about it. Their hearts are so far from God that even with all this evil, they still genuinely believe God is on their side. When they say God approves of all the stuff they're doing, they probably don't think they're wrong. They just don't know anything about God. They lean on Yahweh and say, is not Yahweh in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. You know, this is what Jesus would call the blind, leading the blind, so that they both fall into a pit. The story of Israel's leaders here is not just a story of bad guys, you know, corrupt judges and you know, corrupt king and corrupt priests. It's, it's the story of guys who are completely dead in their rebellion. It's the story of guys with hard hearts. And it's the tragic, it's the tragic tale of spiritual blindness of people who don't know God. It is the end game of all their idolatry. Generations of worshiping false gods, of going to the temple and instead of, of meeting Yahweh, bowing down to a golden calf. There's so much evil in the hearts of these guys because the God of the Bible had been forgotten long ago. Their fathers didn't know him. Their grandfathers didn't know him. So one generation led the nation further and further away, and the next generation led them further and further away. And now by the time of Micah, they don't worship the true and living God. They worship some false God of their own invention. And he's not the kind of God who would say, you must be holy because I am holy and you belong to me. He's not the kind of God who would say, if you want to live long in the land, follow my commandments. The God they made up, the God they invented, is just a God who says, I don't know, man, follow your heart. Get it while they're getting good. Uh, be happy at all times. so much said here about Israel's sin in this generation that it can just be exhausting. And now that they're like 
six books deep into these minor prophets. It probably is exhausting to hear because every single one of these prophets hits on that same thing. That's why there are prophets. We've covered it. And, and most of you can probably see by now how deep the gravity goes. It really does feel like an incurable wound. An infection just can't be gotten rid of. So how does any of this get fixed? How does Israel have any hope of finding the way back? How does this illness get cured? There's an old Hebrew name for Yahweh. Yahweh Rafal. Literally translates to the God who heals. So he reveals through Micah that he's got a prescription. He's got a plan. The nation isn't too far gone. The nation can be saved. It's sort of, sort of the good news expanded to an entire nation of his people. Because you weren't too far gone to be saved. Neither was I. Neither of the people saved to your life and life. Nobody's too far gone for God to reach them. Nobody's too far gone for God to bring them back to the right way. So here goes his plan. It starts with judgment. And then there's this promise of preservation. Judgment won't be the end. There's this promise of restoration. And it ultimately ends up with a promise of righteousness. The end state is everything's back. So like all the Old Testament prophets do, Michael warns Israel that because of all of their rebellion, judgment is coming. And by now, we all probably know what that means. The Assyrians are going to come through in the northern kingdom. There's ten tribes that went up north and built Samaria and split the nation. Well, the Assyrians are going to come for them and take them away as exiles. They're going to lose this great war, and whoever survives is going to be taken away as slaves. And then the Babylonians are going to come and do the exact same thing to Judah, Jerusalem, and the southern kingdom. That's the judgment. And here, this is kind of a unique wrinkle in mind, that here God makes it clear that it is the leaders of the nation who he holds responsible for this. It's in chapter 3, verse 12. Remember, he said, you build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity, there is sin. And then he continues on and says, therefore, because of you, I, so he makes it known, I'm the one doing this, I will plow Zion as a field. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins and turn the city into a forest. So he's going to just destroy everything and let it sit fallow for so long that trees just grow up where they used to be building. The mountain of my house will be a wooded And What's going to happen to all those wicked magistrates and judges and elders and officials and priests and prophets? You know, if God's holding them responsible for all this, what's, what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to the guys who who heard the poor cry out for justice and then stacked the deck against them. What's going to happen to these guys who saw the pain in, in the eyes of widows and children and turned their faces away? Well, listen to what God has to store for them. Chapter 3, verse 4. They will cry out to Yahweh. To God saying, they'll cry out to me. He will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they made their deeds evil. So what they did to the poor, what they did to the powerless, and they cry out to God, he says it's going to be the same thing given back to them. What about the priests and the prophets? Those guys who were happy enough to, you know, lie for a price. Well, God promises these guys are suddenly going to become very quiet now that they're six and five. It says, therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. So they won't be able to make any more promises. The sun will go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from them. Here's something incredible about this. Micah, right, the prophet who they tried to silence, 
basically has this promise that he's going to be the only voice still preaching. Because what he says in verse 8 is, As for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of Yahweh, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and Israel his sin. By the way, that is a that's a definition of the very popular Christian term spirit-filled ministry that uh, most people don't seem to realize is in the Bible. I get asked a few times every year, well, is your ministry spirit-filled? Is this church spirit-filled? And of course it is. Um, but what people are usually asking me with that question is, uh, do you speak in tongues? Do people run up and down in the aisles? Um, do you, you shoot Holy Spirit machine guns at people and make them fall down in the pews? That's a little Benny Hinn reference. Ha ha ha. Um, that's usually what people are asking me when they ask me that question. The definition Micah gives of a spirit-filled ministry, something totally different. Spirit-filled ministry is ministry that preaches the word in and out of season. It's ministry that tells the truth about God, the God of the Bible. That, that stands on his word and preaches his gospel, even if there is an entire nation telling you not. That's the spiritual ministry. That's just a little side note. So Micah's spirit-filled ministry is to announce this judgment that is the beginning of God's plan to restore Israel. And that's where it starts. That's not where it ends. Because after that, there's this promise of preservation. That's part two. What is preservation? Well, it's these promises that there's going to be this remnant of the faithful within this big sinful nation of Israel, and that they're going to be taken away as exiles too. They're going to be kept together, and they're going to be kept alive, and their children and grandchildren will be kept alive, because someday they're going to be brought back to the moon. It's a promise that the exile is not the end of God's people. That there's a faithful remnant among them that he's going to keep safe and keep together and someday call them back to the place that they were brought out of. You can see that in chapter 2 of verse 12. I will gather the remnant of Israel and will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture. And I know I'm bouncing around a little bit, and I apologize for that, but some of these things, you know, they aren't in back-to-back -back verses. So if you go into chapter 3, verse 10, uh, there's this promise from God that basically says, yes, you are going to Babylon. Yes, you will be taken away in exile. But that's not the end of the story. He says their situation is like that of a woman in labor, which means that they are expectantly waiting for something. God says, you will go to Babylon. And from there, I will rescue you. That's part three. Rescue promise from God that you won't leave them in chains, but that someday it's going to bring his children back home. And then that takes you to part four. You can call righteousness. The restoration of God. So the sins of Israel was the focus of chapter two and chapter three here in mind. This restoration, this righteousness going to enjoy in the future. That's the focus of chapter 4 and chapter 5. So I'd just like to read for you this section from Micah 4, which from verse 1 to verse 15. And just pay close attention to what God promises to do and what God promises to deliver. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples. He shall decide disputes for nations, strong nations, far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts is spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. In that day, declares Yahweh, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off the strong nation. And Yahweh will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth. So what promises did you do? God talked about Zion. Right? That's Jerusalem. It's, it's the mountain where he makes his home. This is that mountain. Remember, he had to plow it. He had to tear it down. Now he promises that someday it will be exalted as a place of maximum authority, maximum majesty. <coughs> what he means when he says it will be the highest mountain. This place where his people were dragged away, he now says people will flow to it. And not just, not just Israel, he says people of every nation will be so overcome by God's glory, will be so eager to learn more about God's word that they will actually want to come and learn from him. They will want to belong to him all of his ways. That's the inclusion of the Gentile. Right? There's this promise that his word, his government, his authority will be over even nations far away. That he'll bring an everlasting peace. How does Isaiah talk about Jesus? It's one of those verses we remember around Christmas time a lot. Isaiah chapter 6. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God, Prince of Peace, His child given to us of His increase and the increase of His government that will be no end. You heard a promise there that the people of God will never fall away again. We will walk in His name forever and ever. That's the return of Christ. The establishment of this thousand year kingdom that stretches to the ends of the earth. That's us together in the new world. Where perfect peace is the mode of the day, every single day, where, where there are no weapons of war, where there's not even a thought of war, where nobody makes God's people afraid that they're dead. Turn with me to Micah chapter 5. Here's what we learn in Micah 5. Is Prophecy continues. All this will be accomplished through a ruler who God will send. And what a good word that is to a nation where their leaders, their rulers, from talk a lot of them failed. Right? The priests, the prophets, the judges, the king, they had all failed to protect the people. And now God promises, I'm going to send you a ruler who actually will be perfect. And everywhere that they feel fail, he will succeed. It's a better prophet. It's a better judge. It's a better king. We pick it up in chapter five, verse two. It's a promise that this ruler should come out of the tiny little town called Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem, have the thought, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. And you shall come forth from me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Jump down for me to verse 4. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of Yahweh, in the majesty of the name of Yahweh is God. And they shall dwell securely. For now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be great to us. So this leader comes from the old, from the ancient days. So he seems to exist before he shows up in heaven, but he does come out of heaven. 
who serves the people of God as his ruler and as a shepherd of you, who has all the strength of the Lord, who can make the people of God to dwell secure, and whose name will be made great to the ends of the earth, and who is peace for his people. Who does that sound like to you? I'm hearing some mumbling of Jesus. Good answer. Jesus is revealed to us here in Micah chapter 5 to be God's answer to Israel's failure. We ask, how, how does Israel get to find the way back? How can all this be fixed? But God says, this ruler good shepherd. He's the answer. Jesus is God's answer for all the chaos that we endure and suffer. Because Jesus is this perfect ruler. He rules over his people with perfect justice, with perfect wisdom, with perfect compassion, and perfect love. He's the one who is the cure for the incurable wound. He is our peace. At the end of all of our services, I covered that little priestly blessing in numbers. And the last thing is in the God who is peace. The good news tells us he's given you peace. Jesus is our peace. He shall be your peace. God said to Michael that his people had risen up against him as enemies. Jesus is the promise that they won't say that they forever. That his children who were far off would be brought near. And that there will someday be true peace between God and his people. And that it's brought by his chosen one, his anointed leader, Jesus Christ, Jesus our Messiah. It is only through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus that we, even though we were once all enemies of God, can be reconciled to Him, have real, right relationship with Him, can know Him as Father, this Father we were once so far away from. It's only by His sacrifice that we were set free from sin. That our sins are forgiven. It's only by His death and resurrection that we are made new. That we are born again as new creations. That there is such a thing as the old person and the new person. Because we've been regenerated as these people with renewed minds and with changed hearts. Here's our only hope. To have real rest have perfect peace, to have everlasting life, to have a relationship with God. All the promises, like his prophecies here in chapter 4. Jesus is God's answer to all of our chaos. That's the message. <clears throat> all of that was true when Micah first prophesied these words. All of it remains true today. And when I say all of it, I mean all the evil and all the corruption. You can find it. You don't even have to look that hard for it. It's still here. But God's answer to it is also still here. You know, it occurred to me some time ago when I was studying 2 Timothy, chapters 3 and 4, which if you know that better at all, it's probably the chapters that you remember those are the chapters where Paul warns Timothy about how it's just evil and terrible uh, the world and the people in the world and the people in the church are going to get. How self-consumed and self-concerned everyone's going to be. Well, one thing to know about those chapters is that Paul, as he writes that, he, he knows that he is not making predictions about some faraway future. He's writing about the last days. 
then he knows he's living in the middle of the last days. He's writing about what will happen in the church of his own generation. If you go through and read his letters, a lot of it has already happened to him. He's writing about what's going to happen in the church in every generation that comes after him until Jesus returns. Because that's the period of the last days. It's everything from the ascension of Jesus to the return of Jesus. So when Paul writes, for instance, that that people will become, when he says people, he's talking about people in the church, but that people will become lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, and unholy, and the list actually continues. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. When he warns Timothy that, that evil imposters have infiltrated the church and will infiltrate the church to deceive others. When he says that there's going to come this time when people no longer endure sound teaching but have itching ears, instead of looking for truth, they just go and find teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. And they'll turn away from the truth and wander off into myths. He's not making a lot of bold, outlandish predictions. In fact, after studying Micah, a lot of that should sound pretty familiar. Because I think what Paul's doing there is, is remembering the problems of God's people in the past, in these Old Testament generations. His prediction is not that people are going to have all these new patterns of sin. It's that all of these sins from these previous generations are going to repeat in the future. That the sins that were there in Old Testament Israel are going to come up again in New Testament Israel, which is the church, the Israel of God. As I call it. And if you look around, we'll find that to be true. There are still teachers who can be bought for a price. There are still teachers who aren't really interested in teaching the truth, but whose message changes depending on what's going to put the most in their belly and in their pocket. Call me cynical if you want, but I don't know if this feels like something that's true to you, but it does to me that there seems to be a correlation between big, like mega church ministries and really bad preaching. Really unfaithful teaching. And I think the reason that correlation seems to exist and this is the cynical part, it's actually just simple economics. Big churches have big bills. So they got to do big, stupid things to bring people in the door. Preaching the gospel of Christ crucified for the salvation of our souls and the forgiveness of our sins it might be good for the flock. It might be what people need. But it doesn't seem to buy basketball or anything. It doesn't seem to buy private chance. If you look around, you'll find that there's still people who are motivated by this. There are still leaders who are greedy for gain. You know the word says that would disqualify them from the leadership. Within the church, there's still the exploitation of the poor and vulnerable. That's Jesse McClanus' business model. plenty of pastors who get brought up on charges of sexual abuse, get caught in affairs. It's all tragic. And it's all gross. And it's all corrupt. And it's all from that same incurable wound. The sins of the church today are the same as they were of God's people all these centuries ago. That's the bad news. There's the good news there's still an answer. And just like the sins, the pattern of sin remains the same, God's answer remains the same. God's answer to all that chaos is Jesus. It is our salvation found in Him and Him alone. The return of Christ, the promise of the new world, Resurrection and eternal life, that's still the only cure for the incurable wound. 
that's still the last part in that prescription God gave you. Restoration of righteousness. Church hurt is real. How do you know when someone's church hurt? Don't worry about that. I'll tell you a lot of it. There's very real chaos within the family of God's people. Gossiping, backbiting, biting, and devouring. It still happens. It happens from a lot of pulpits. It happens in a lot of views. And that can make that can make people who really care about the church really angry. And you just want to take charge and lash out and tear things down and, and build things anew and, and be the one who fixes all the problems also make people really anxious. Make people think life would be better if we just pull the rip and die. Just walk away from the church. Well, the answer to all of this chaos is not our anxiety and it's not our anger. It's the gospel of Christ. He is our peace. And if we cling to Him and to depend on Him and Him alone, we can find peace. We'd be so much better off instead of leaving the church or trying to rebuild parts of the church or whatever. And if we just came together and clung to Christ as a family, how many conflicts could be settled if brothers and sisters who have been fighting just came back together and remembered same way God loves me is the same way God loves you. The salvation He gave to me is the salvation He gave to me. How many broken relationships could be restored? People would just remember that we've all been bought at the highest price. And that our brothers and sisters are people who God has given us to love and serve and not to treat them like or even the love to be in So, anger, our anxiousness, our chaos, how care in the world that we're in. I don't want to just limit it to this church because you probably have friends who go to other churches and you, know, you can find Christians anywhere. And they're, they're, they're standing all over the so it's the chaos from out in the world or within the family of God's people. He's bringing you to places of anxiety and anger, places where you're thinking, I have got to go or something's kind of changed. No, don't be so eager to pursue either of those things. Hear the word of the Lord and find your peace in Jesus. Stay faithful to Him. Lean on Him. Amen be able to follow some of these other things to find in the New Testament and count it all good when trials find them. Bear good fruit <coughs> against all challenges and in all seasons. Trust in the gospel and all its promises. And the reason that song from Oliver Anthony got so popular so fast is a lot of other people in the world who heard it and heard that line, I wish I could wake up and have it not be true, and they thought, yeah, but we to. This is exhausting. And things aren't the way they should be. And they're right. But when we have that thought, when we have that impulse, there's still the possibility for peace. Peace is still on offer. Worship team rejoins us. I'm just going to give you this word from 1 Peter chapter 5. I think Peter has a pretty powerful word about how to find peace when you wake up and have that thought. He doesn't say take things into your own hands. He doesn't say run away. He doesn't say it's on you to fix it. He says humble yourself, therefore, under God's hand, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. 
casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, after you suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, He will restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. To Him,
Thank you. 